So today's video is on gas exchange in plants. So first we're going to have a look at the basic movement of gases through a plant. So during the day, carbon dioxide is taken into the plant for photosynthesis because carbon dioxide is one of the reactants in this reaction. And oxygen is released because oxygen is produced by photosynthesis. But during the night, oxygen is taken into the plant for respiration. And this is because photosynthesis isn't happening during the night, so there is no oxygen being produced to provide the cells for respiration. And carbon dioxide is being released. And this is because carbon dioxide isn't being used up by the plant in photosynthesis, so it's an excess in the plant. And it's important to note that respiration is always happening, day or night. But photosynthesis only happens during the day. It only happens during sunlight hours. And this is because it, photosynthesis needs this sunlight. It needs this um, energy from the sun to perform photosynthesis. Now we're going to have a look at the structure of a leaf before we look at how that makes for effective gas exchange. So first there is the waxy lipid cuticle and this covers the surface of the plant. Then we have the palisade mesophyll. So this is tightly packed cells full of chloroplasts which contain chlorophyll. And chlorophyll is a green light absorbent pigment. And so this is what is very important in photosynthesis. So these palisade cells contain loads of chloroplasts which contain lots of this pigment. Then we have our vascular bundle or vein. So this is here and this contains our xylem and phloem tubes to provide these cells with the correct substances needed for their normal cellular activities and reactions like photosynthesis. Then we have our spongy mesophyll. So this is here. So this is full of numerous interconnecting air spaces and we'll see why that's important in a minute. And then we have our stoma, singular, or stomata, plural. So these are small pore-like holes at the um, lower epidermis, so on the bottom surface of the leaves, and these are controlled by guard cells. So these guard cells control the size of these stomatal pores. So how does a leaf have effective gas exchange? What adaptions does this leaf have? And we just have to note that there is no specific exchange system in a leaf. It just uh, mainly depends on diffusion. So this leaf depends on diffusion for its gas exchange. It doesn't have a specific system like humans do. It doesn't have the lungs. It doesn't have anything like that. It just relies on simple diffusion. So first we have our stomata, and the stomata is very effective for gas, gas exchange because it decreases the diffusion pathway because the gas can simply enter the leaf without having to diffuse through a surface like the waxy cuticle, for example. It can just go straight into the leaf. And then we have our spongy mesophyll. So our spongy mesophyll helps to maintain concentration gradients of gases, so these gases can diffuse down these gradients and also the interconnecting air spaces allows gases to come into contact with all the cells. So as these air spaces branch through the spongy mesophyll these gases are able to get to all of the cells and it also increases the surface area because if the cell is surrounded more by um, the air then it will have more surface area for these gases to diffuse into the cell. Then we have our palisade cells, so these contain our chloroplasts, and these are close to the surface of the leaf, and this is because we need um, these cells to get the most sunlight, and they're also tightly packed. So as they're tightly packed, that means there's more chloroplasts at the top of the cell for more um, sunlight energy to be absorbed for more photosynthesis. And then we have our guard cells, so these control the size of the stomatal pore, and this means it controls gas exchange and it limits water loss. So this gas exchange is controlled because the gases have to diffuse through the stomata. So if these guard cells control the size of the stomata, they control gas exchange. 
And we also have to note that this exchange is in the gaseous phase. And we know that gases diffuse faster than liquids. So this makes for effective exchange because they diffuse faster in the gaseous form. And also the leaf is very thin. So no cell is too far from the air. So this adds to the short diffusion pathway. So how does a plant reduce water loss? So effective gas, gas exchange often goes hand in hand with water loss. So if um, as a leaf has effective gas exchange, it is m highly probable that it would have a lot of water loss. So plants like xerophytes need adaptions. So these are plants that live in dry areas, um, in areas that have very limited water, like deserts. And so if the water potential outside the leaf is lower than inside the leaf, water will move down this water potential gradient. So if the um, outside of the leaf has a, like the atmosphere has a lower water potential this means that the water inside the leaf will move down the water potential gradient out of the leaf so how can a plant reduce its water loss because it does need water for many of its important processes like photosynthesis so a first adaption is a waxy cuticle and so these waxy cuticles covering the surface of the plant, they're waterproof. And so this means that water cannot escape it. And the thicker the waxy cuticle, the less water that can escape. So if it is living in an area with limited water, it's most likely going to have a thick, thicker waxy cuticle to avoid as much water loss as possible. And then there's also the rolling up of the leaf. So when rolling up the leaf, it isolates the lower epidermis. So the lower epidermis is where the stomata are. So as it rolls up, it isolates the lower epidermis inside of this roll. It traps a region of still air. So it traps a region of still air around this lower epidermis. And this air that it's trapped becomes saturated with water vapour. And this water vapour is being evaporated from the leaf out of the stomata. So this air that's been isolated around the stomata is now becoming highly saturated with the water vapour that is leaving the plant. And as it becomes more saturated, this increases the water potential in the air region. So in this roll of the leaf, our still air has a higher water potential as the water vapour is evaporating from the leaf. And so because this water potential is increasing, the water potential gradient between the leaf and the air decreases or completely disappears. So there is no water potential gradient. And so this means that the water does not evaporate out of the leaf down a water potential gradient, because as we know, usually it would um, the water vapour would diffuse down the water potential gradient to the atmosphere where there is a lower water potential but because the water potential in this trapped still region is higher it means that there's no water potential gradient for the water to evaporate down and then we have hairy leaves so these hairy leaves trap a still moist layer of air so just like the hair on our arms create an insulating layer for us the hairy leaves trap a still moist layer of air around the leaf. So this works in the same way as rolling the leaf because the water potential gradient from the leaf to the moist trapped air by these hairs decreases. So because the water potential around the leaf is now higher, the water potential gradient lower. So this means that less water will evaporate out of the leaf down this water potential gradient. And lastly, reducing the surface area to volume ratio. So we know that the surface area to volume ratio goes hand in hand with the rate of diffusion. So if we reduce this surface area to volume ratio, we reduce our rate of diffusion. And um, hence, we reduce the volume of water that can be evaporated at once. And so 
even though we reduce the rate of diffusion of water out of the plant, we still need to make sure that this balances with the rate of photosynthesis. So we still need to have a surface area to volume ratio that's large enough to provide the entire plant with carbon dioxide for photosynthesis, for example. And now moving on to the guard cells. So these are on the lower epidermis, surrounding the stomata, controlling gas exchange. So guard cells detect environmental stimuli. So this could be temperature, humidity, carbon dioxide levels, drought, and so on. And so when they detect these environmental stimuli, they use these to either open or close. And this is depending on the stimuli and depending on the gases that they need at that moment in time. For example, they know that the stomata will need to be open during the day for photosynthesis because they need to get carbon dioxide into the plant because that's a reactant for photosynthesis. And during the night, they'll need to close to limit the water loss. So now we're going to have a look at how the stomata open. So this could be during the day when uh, the plant needs carbon dioxide to diffuse into the plant for photosynthesis. So the guard cells take up sugars and ions from the surrounding cells. So these sugars and ions move into the guard cells and this in turn decreases the water potential in the guard cells. So as these sugars and ions are taken in, it decreases the water potential in these guard cells. And this causes an influx of water via osmosis. And osmosis is the movement of water from a high water potential to a low water potential. And because our water potential inside our guard cells is low, the water from the surrounding cells will move into our guard cells down this water potential gradient. And this causes the turgor pressure inside the guard cells to increase. So because all of this water has moved into the guard cells, the turgor pressure increases. And this causes the guard cells to become turgid. So they're swollen with all of this water that has moved into them. And this opens the stomatal pore. So as the guard cells take up these sugars and ions, they decrease the water potential in the guard cells. And this decreasing in water potential causes an influx of water down a water potential gradient into the guard cells, increasing the guard cells' turgid pressure. They become turgid and this opens our stomatal pore, allowing for gas exchange. And then the closing of the stomata. So this could be during the night where they need to limit water loss. So the guard cells will release ions and sugars to the surrounding cells. So this is the opposite to stomata opening. So the guard cells will release all of these sugars and ions to the surrounding cells. And this makes the water potential inside the guard cells increase. So as they lose all these sugars and ions, the water potential inside them increases. And this causes water to leave the guard cells via osmosis. So because the water, uh, because the guard cells now have a higher water potential, the water will move down the water potential gradient to the surrounding cells with a lower water potential. So the water leaves the guard cells. And this makes the turgid pressure decrease. So because this water has left the guard cells, the turgid pressure inside the guard cells decreases. And this makes the guard cells become flaccid, so they become limp. And this closes the stomatal pore. So these guard cells release the sugars and ions, and this causes the water potential in the guard cells to increase. And because of this increase in water potential, the water leaves the cells via osmosis. So as this water leaves, the turgid pressure inside the guard cells decreases, causing them to become flaccid and close the stomatal pore.